So, uh, last week, Keith spoke very helpfully on the uh, new wine skin, and a lot of us found that very relevant. Uh, afterwards, he said it was a word for now. Um, you'll be aware that we haven't got a consecutive series going, so we're just going for the inspiration <coughs> of the moment. And I was led to this chapter, and again, it's a, a, a word for now. It just focuses again uh, what we are as the people of God, and gives us the bigger picture of what God's plan is. Um, I know he's concerned about the minute details of life, um, but we, we need our, to keep our eyes on the bigger picture of what he's doing. And encapsulated in these four verses is the big plan of God. So let me read it. So this is the prophet speaking the word of God. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law, the islands will put their hope. I'll refer to other verses before and after that, um, but just take that as the, the central verse this morning. Okay, would somebody like to pray as we um, spend time around the word? So you can go to Maggie afterwards and say, that prayer was answered, or no, that prayer wasn't answered. <laughs> he said far too much. <laughs> what was he on about? <laughs> I, I want to start just with a, a basic uh, principle that's right there in the beginning of Genesis. don't need to turn to it. I'll just read to it. So you know the story of uh, Cain and Abel. The Lord says to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Um, and God says... Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. And whenever injustice, whenever a wrong is perpetuated, God responds to that. And in Isaiah 42, one of the strong themes running throughout it all is that God will establish justice. And so we don't have a God who is immune to the injustices of life and to the atrocities and to the things that are wrong. Indeed, he's hearing the cry of the earth, the cry of the people, that it shouldn't be like this. And God isn't deaf and he's not unresponsive, so he hears and he's going to do something about it. I'd want to say at the beginning that uh, Hebrews, uh, the writer to the Hebrews, picks up on this. And it says, as Christians, we, we've come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And the blood of Abel cries for justice, some might even say revenge, you know, to put things right which are wrong. But the, the scripture says that the shed blood of Jesus compared to the shed blood of Abel speaks of a, of a better word. When it was written to the, Hebrew, to the writers of the Hebrews, uh, it was preparing them for a time when they would undergo great persecution. And in succeeding uh, years, many Christians lost their life and their blood was shed. And you think, the injustice of that, the enormity, the, the, uh, the, the, the inhumanity of it. 
But the, the scripture is reminding for them and for us that our well-being, our security, does not depend upon people around us behaving rightly towards us. I was uh, speaking with a guy this week who rightly had reason to be upset and to be angry and frustrated. And I was saying that to him. If your well-being depends upon other people who have authority and power over you making the right decisions, you're going to be frustrated forever. But if you can find a peace and a security, regardless of the circumstances around, in the face of injustice in the world, if you're safe in that covenant, that what, what he says, you've come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God, thousands, to the church of the firstborn. This is where we live, irrespective of the situation round about us, then you can cope. But if in life we're expecting that, you know, unless everything's right, I'm not going to be happy. That's not what, what the gospel promised or, or even what Jesus offered. There is, and, and you don't need me to tell you, that there, there is still a, a cry for justice on the earth. When we, when we read the reports, when, uh, if it's very close to us and it touches us personally, um, there is something, not only the ground cries up, but we cry and we sing sometimes, don't we? How long? till there's justice on the earth. And, and within us, I think it's a part of the characteristic of God being made in his image, that we have a, a, an inbuilt sense that something is wrong. Um, the child from early age, it's not fair. Yeah. And they instinctively know. Now, they may not always know what is right, but they instinctively know that was wrong, that was unfair. And when we look at uh, Isaiah 42, um, the, the strong thread running through it is this justice. If you've got your Bible there. It says, verse 1, This servant of the Lord will bring justice to the nations. In verse 3, in faithfulness or in, in truth, he will bring forth tr justice. It will happen. That's what it's saying. Justice will be seen on the earth. And then in verse 4, this servant of the Lord, he will not falter or be discouraged. He's not going to give up in the face of injustice and in the, in the face of rejection of his work and his ministry. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on the earth. And in this, the islands will put their hope. And every week we're hearing of people trying to get to the... Uh, trying to make a, an accurate assessment of what is right and what is wrong. Another inquiry is set up. What happened? Why did they... Who's responsible? What should be the consequences? The Hillsborough, the Grenfell Tower. Um... Did they use chemical weapons in Syria? Who's covering up? What, it, what, it, what is the truth? And now President Trump saying that there's the, the, the election, there was corruption, and he's insisting <laughs> names and uh, details are given of the voting people, and there's some people saying, go take a jump. We're not doing that. But uh, trying to sort out what, what is right and what is wrong here. God is saying, here's my servant. And he will bring justice. It's not a, a martial uh, court of law. It's not a, uh, an inquiry. It's not a, a coalition of governments. It says he will bring justice. He will determine what is right and what is wrong. And he, he, well, we understand this servant is one person. This one person will bring justice to all the nations of the earth. And when you think of the complex cases that are around, and he's saying, here, look, here's my servant, and he will bring justice to the nations. Now, biblically, and um, those of you who've read the, the book about how to read the Old Testament, and uh, you're looking at the Old Testament, we can't say, when Isaiah wrote this, he, he was talking about Jesus. He didn't know about Jesus. All he's got is a word from God. God is going to have a servant. 
and he's going to bring justice. Some people have thought it was the nation of Israel. Israel were to be the servant uh, of the Lord. Um, some say, because uh, l- later on, in a few verses, there's a prediction that Cyrus will come and he will fulfill God's purpose. So is Cyrus the servant of the Lord who will bring justice to the nations? Well, the answer is given for us by Jesus himself. Because Jesus takes these words and says, <laughs> actually, it's me. <laughs> Hi, I'm here. <laughs> It wasn't Israel, it wasn't Cyrus, it wasn't... Now, there have been other servants who have fulfilled the purposes of God, but in this respect, it's one person, and we call his name Jesus. And it says he will establish justice. Well, what is justice? Is it what you think is right? (laughs) How do we... But what is justice? Because, you know, I meet some guys who think doing bad things was all right. (laughs) Justice in its simplest sense is, that will be right. That is what is seen to be right. And it's a recognition of what is right and the rewards that come with that. But there's also the other side of the coin, what is wrong and the consequences that follow on from that. As it's uh, we, in the series we looked at recently, it was quoted, will, will not the God of all the earth do right? Bring about what is right for that which was right and for that which was wrong. was wrong. And it's where our confidence in God needs to be rooted. Um, you know, we're multi-faith society, different philosophies and that sort of things. But what, what if the belief we had was the, the, the one in control, the, the God who rules everything, was a bit capricious? He could be persuaded by, you know, pleas or sacrifices or chants or, I don't know, whatever. What if he was twisted and he was corruptible? Um, What if he was monstrous and the God didn't bring about what was right? Because you you get these, I don't watch them, but sky-fi films and aliens and monsters. You know, who'd want to live in a universe controlled by these, you know? (laughs) What if the God was selfish and he just wanted it his way, regardless of anything else? And Isaiah is saying, there is somebody coming in the name of the Lord who will bring to to right what is right in God's eyes. So it's not what is right in our eyes. It's if we can look at the acts of God and say, yes, God, you did get that right. Well done. <laughs> you know, I agree with you. You can carry on that course. <laughs> it's God making the judgment himself. This is right and this, this is wrong. But I, I, I was helped by reading some uh, commentaries about this. That there is a, there's a, a dimension to this which isn't just putting right the injustices, so the abuse, the violence, uh, the breaking of the Ten Commandments, so that people live in a good society. So let's, let's have right living in life. The, the commentator was saying, actually, what God sees as justice goes beyond that. It's more about knowing who God is rather than getting people to do right on earth. And it comes out of the whole, the whole prophecy in, in Isaiah. Oh, okay, so um, take verse 5. And there are three things I want to mention which are fundamentally being eroded in our community, in our nation. Uh, it's being taken out of people's thinking. Verse 5. This is what the Lord, God the Lord says. He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk in it. What is right, what is just, is that people acknowledge that all life has come from God. He's the author of life. 
Everything we are and everything we have, every breath of life we have, it's because he is. And that, oh, where did we come from? We were talking about last week, soup. <laughs> Primeval soup or something, or you know, collision of atoms or something. But God says, I created it, I gave life. And justice is, what is right, is when people come to acknowledge God as the creator. The one who made us and to whom we're accountable. It's an interesting fact that God is a person who can command that you worship him. Who else would do that? Unless it was the right thing to do. Because he says, you shall worship no other God but me. And when Jesus was on earth, they worshipped him. He didn't say, no, 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 don't do that, please. You know, that's not right. <laughs> he received worship because that is the right thing to do. And Isaiah is saying there's somebody who's going to call people back to acknowledging that you have a Father in heaven who gave you life and holds all things together. The second thing, which this commentator, and I agree with him, you may not, um, it, it might come as a bit of a, oh, I'm not sure about that. But in, in chapter 40, in verse 27, um, I've heard Keith often quote these, these verses, it, uh, the, saying to the people of Israel, Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard that the, the Lord is the everlasting God? And then it goes on to say, chapter 41 and verse 8, You, O Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. And the second strand of what is right is that God has chosen his people and the choices and the, the decisions of God are irrevocable. And what, what people want to do for the nation of Israel is eliminate Israel. God, through the people of Israel, has brought the prophets, the covenants, the law, the promises, the Messiah. And now there's a hostility against the nation of Israel. But they're God's chosen. Equally, let me translate it, I don't believe the church replaces Israel, but equally, and if you've been at the Bible study with Fiona on a Wednesday, they've been looking at Ephesians, and in Ephesians it says that God, through the church, wants to demonstrate to the heavenly powers what, what his purposes and his plans are. And so as there's pressure on the nation of Israel, so we, as God's chosen people, the world wants to eliminate the church, make it irrelevant. You haven't moved with the times. <laughs> you, 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 you destroy people's culture. There's lots of isms amongst you. <laughs> it's not right. And the justice is, the world needs to recognise, those I've chosen, I've chosen. Historically, God has a plan, a purpose that he's working out. The third thing is that um, the word of God, back just to chapter 14, verse 27. Uh, sorry, I've missed that one. Uh, don't, sorry, 41 and verse 1. Where God says to the, to the nations, be silent before me. <laughs> he doesn't say it, but shut up, will you? <laughs> Would you please be quiet? Let me speak. Where everybody has an opinion about everything, and every every reason, every argument is as valid. If it's true for you, it's that's okay. And God is saying, forty-one and verse twenty-one. Bit of sarcasm here. Present your case, says the Lord. Set forth your arguments. Bring in your idols to tell us what is going to happen. Tell us what the former things were, if you can, so that we may consider them, or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds, so that we may know you are gods. And all these philosophies, all these uh, other uh, ways to God, it is right, it is just, it is the, the right thing to happen, that the word of God would be heard again and received and obeyed. Those three things are trying to, being eroded. 
And if you look at the life of Jesus, what did he do? Brought people back. Say, if you want to know, our Father in heaven, that's a relationship with God who gave you life. He says to the disciples, you didn't choose me, I chose you. God made a choice. And who are you to go against God's choice? And of course, Jesus is the living word himself. And we're saying as Christians that in the person of Jesus, there is the servant of the Lord who brings about what is right, what is just, if people are in relationship with him. Grandchildren sometimes do little shows or something like that. And the phrase is, da-da! <laughs> yes! <laughs> and this is what Isaiah say. Da-da! Here he is. It, 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 is the, uh, it, it is the revelation. It is the unveiling. Here is the servant. I want to take a moment, and I'll only take a moment, uh, to, to say something that I read in another commentary from, uh, by John Oswald, which I found very interesting. I'm... I'm nearly going to read what I've written here because just to get it right he says that in the time of Isaiah and maybe even today in a pagan world the, the understanding is that everything that exists is part of everything else there's a cycle of life there's no distinction between the creation and the creator the creator is the creation the creation is the creator all is God and we're all God and it all goes round and in that thinking, the cycle of life continues. What has been, it'll come round again. There's nothing new under the sun. And because the gods are part of this circle of life, they're in this creation, they can't tell you what's going to happen because it's just coming round and round and round again. And John Oswald was saying that in their thinking... No, none of their gods could say how it began because they're in that circle themselves. Nor can they say what is going to be because it's just going round and round and round. And no god could announce something that had never been before because everything had always been before. And Isaiah comes in and he strikes right across all these pagan gods, all, all the gods of the Canaanites and the Egyptians... And in verse 42, verse 9, the Lord says, See the former things have taken place, and new things, I declare. Something that has never been before is going to happen. Outside of this circle. Because God isn't going around in a circle. He's going from a beginning. He's the Alpha. And what is he? He's the Omega. And something is taking place along this line. And into this timeline, God does something new. Which has never happened before. And that is, God becomes flesh and dwells amongst us. And you wouldn't work that out by yourself. It only comes by revelation. It's a revelation that was given to Adam, to Noah, to Moses, to David, to Isaiah, and fully comes in form in the person of Jesus Christ. When Isaiah wrote these words, it was about 750 years before Jesus. So people had heard, here's my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. And then they think, okay. <laughs> and then Mary hears, you're going to have a son. And the time is fulfilled when it comes to pass. Now it's David Pawson, who uh, we've appreciated a lot in his teaching, he says that if you take the prophecies, the prophecies in the Old Testament, I can't remember the figure, but a, a huge proportion of them have been fulfilled to the letter. So if we take the promises about the kingdom of God coming on earth, if all those up to now have been fulfilled, what about the ones that are still to be fulfilled? Do we believe they, they're actually going to come? Will this, the servant of God bring justice on the earth? Will the, will the nations see in him their hope, their salvation? Um, 
It's been advertised elsewhere, but uh, when, when I was in Whitemore on somebody's desk, I picked up this leaflet for London Bible Week. So it's Fiona's birthday in a couple of weeks. So for a birthday treat, I'm going to take her to listen to two Bible lectures. I oh, know. <laughs> but it's Tom Wright, who she's quite taken with, Tom Wright. And so we're, we're, we're going down on, on the Friday to listen to two. But in the, in the London Bible Week, um, Fiona pointed out I hadn't read this. But uh, there's a quote that they've put here, which I'm going to read to you, uh, and it's from Mahatma Gandhi. You Christians look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all civilization to pieces, to turn the world upside down and bring peace to a battle-torn planet. But you treat it as though it is nothing more than a piece of literature. That's quite a comment, isn't it? You, know, just, you Christians look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all civilization to pieces, turn the world upside down, and bring peace to a battle-torn planet. And it centers on the person of Jesus, that he will bring right all that is wrong. It's a plan of salvation. It's a plan of, uh, uh, of redemption. So that's why it's not Cyrus, because Cyrus did raise his voice. And any weakling, he just crushed. He marched right over them. It wasn't the nation of Israel. They were meant to be. They were meant to be a, a, a light to the Gentiles. But uh, throughout the prophecy of Isaiah, God is having a bit, bit of go. Though your sins be a scarlet, come on. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. So they didn't fulfill this perfect ideal. Now the one who would come, it says... He'll not cry out or shout in the street. He doesn't have to have a publicity machine. He doesn't have to walk down the street with banners. I am the Messiah. Let's get a, a, you know, a, a crowd behind me with all saying, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> he just was who he was. If people were broken in their life, like a bruised reed, what did he do? Say, oh, you're rubbish, you're no good. What did he do? He healed them. He restored them. He made them whole. People saw Jesus and said, perhaps with this man there's, there's some hope for life. A flick, flickering wick. I'm just about finished. I'm just about done in. Actually, come to me. You'll find life in all its fullness. That's the justice that Isaiah is talking about. A servant who will take what is broken, what is damaged, and bring restoration and hope and life. Without political power, without armies, without might of muscle, without crushing people, without destroying people, he'll come and establish the kingdom. And it'll be for the islands, not just for the nation of Israel, it's for the whole world. So what is it? What, what, what is it that we're about? What, how we get caught up in this, this plan? How are we part of this work of salvation? It is to make sure that we give the living God his due and rightful place in our life. That is only right. It is right and proper that we worship God. We acknowledge him as who he is. It's right and proper that we acknowledge that he is the one in charge of history. We have to, our democratic votes and you know, our duties as citizens and all that sort of thing. But it is God who is working his purpose out. And with that comes a peace and serenity. Though the mountains fall into the sea, what do we do? We trust in the Lord. It is God who's bringing about his plans. And it is God who is bringing his word to bear in our lives. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. That's how we live. You need bread. <laughs> but we live by the word of God. And it's all justice comes when people are in right relationship with God. 
That's what Romans says. Now we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Then consequences follow on. If you're out of step with God, it don't go right. We all know that, don't we? But when you come in step with God, when it's right on the inside, things begin to go right on the outside. And that is what pleases God. When he says, here's my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I, I found somebody who could fulfill my purpose. This, this is what brings me joy. He saw the blood of Abel when his heart was broken. He looked in the days of Noah and he was grieved that it, it created man because it was corrupt in every way. But then he finds somebody who says, yeah, I want to know you. And I will live with you. And I will live by what you say is right. God's purpose begins with the people of God. That's the nation of Israel. But then it was to spread out to the nations. I believe, and uh, this is why we're committed to the church, I believe, although that, you know, there's lots of good, that goodness does, isn't the monopoly of Christians, obviously. Um, there's a lot of good that happens out there, but I think God's redemption, his salvation plan, begins with the church. And then spreads out. And it is through the church. And every time, every time, we preach the word. Every time we help somebody, every time we, 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 we pray, we minister to people, we're bringing the kingdom of God into their life. We're, we're bringing the justice of God. And that's the big picture. You know, when we're working in the Rose Fair, stacking cha- tables or chairs, you know, when you're serving coffee, keep in mind the big picture. There's a, ser- there's a, there's a time coming when the... There is a time coming... When the earth will be filled with the glory of God. As the waters cover the sea. Amen. 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 Let's take a moment to pray. And then it's, it's 10 to, but uh, if somebody wants to add a helpful comment after that, just let, let's pray together. You might feel inspired to pray and just petition the Lord, whatever's right.